You went through the water, but the water didn't overflow you because as much as the enemy was buffeting and moving and pushing, God stepped in and said, you can only go so far. And uh, 1 Samuel 30, we're looking at the scripture today. It says uh, in verse 2, in verse 2, and had taken the woman captive, captives that were therein, they slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. Verse 6 says, And David was greatly distressed. For the people spake of stone in him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David had encouraged himself in the Lord. Praise God. Verse 6 says, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stone in him, Sister Sally, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his son and for his daughters. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Praise God. I'm speaking to you today from the subject, Get Back Up. Get Back Up. Can you look at, look at somebody beside you and tell them, Get Back Up back up. Get, get back up. Get back up. Get back up. I was looking at a recent survey, and um, the survey was looking at different holidays across North America, all the holidays and the special days, and they were trying to um, determine which ones were most popular. I was happy to see that in the survey, uh, they identified Christmas as the most popular holiday. I was happy to see that uh, after that, there was Easter as well. So at the top in North America, Christmas and, and Easter are the most uh, popular holidays. And I'm happy to see that as a child of God, as a man of God, as a Christian, as a person who believes in the Word of God, and a, a, a person of faith, I, I'm happy to see that we're in a part of the world where at least we recognize the value in these holidays. I went down the list, Pastor Mark, and I continued to see that... Um, uh, that uh, right up there was Mother's Day, praise God, right below Christmas, well, not exactly one beneath, right be beneath Christmas and Easter, there was uh, uh, Mother's Day, praise God. Good to have Sister, um, Sister Erica and, brother, and Paul with us this morning. Happy to see you. I forgot to mention that. I told you I'd say it. And Abigail. Um, and Mother's Day was right there. And I, I was happy to see that because our mothers are so important in our society. They're so necessary, Brother Chris. They're people we can't do without, praise God. And, and we love our mothers, and we give them everything that we can give them, especially on, on Mother's Day. But naturally, I wanted to see where was Father's Day on the list, because not because I want to compete, not because I think it's a question of importance, who is more important, or who is more valued, but, but I just wanted to see because Mothers can't be mothers without fathers. And if mothers are there, then the fathers should be somewhere near in the list. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying to you? I, I was watching to see where fathers are going to come in the list. Because, because if mothers are high up, we, we should at least identify our fathers in the list. And I was looking and I was looking and I went down to five. I went down to six. I went down to seven. I didn't see any fathers. I had to go down to number eight until it was Father's Day, Sister Elsa. And what I realized was that they rated things like Labor Day, <laughs> before fathers. Martin Luther King Jr. Day, who himself is a father, was rated higher than Father's Day. And as I said, it's not a matter of value or importance. The question that I had in my mind was, how do we view, how do we perceive, what, uh, uh, how do we look at the different roles that we have in society. That's what I wanted to understand, not, not who is more important. It's not competition because everybody is valuable, but I want to understand how do we view, how do, va and, and it's not just mothers and fathers, it's also how we look at men and women and the role that they play in society. I want to understand how we look at them, praise God. And I was curious, Pastor Matt, because I want to see, and there's always been this question about the sexes, and we talk about who is stronger, and who is weaker, and who is this, and who is that, praise God. And when I looked at it, I realized that there is a viewpoint that people have that may be different 
than the actual way they feel about the person. Watch this. I realize, Sister Mac, that, that you can't look at how a, you can test how we value somebody based on how popular they are on a list. Okay. L let me break it down. Let me break it down. Uh, I I've seen that there are certain men who are, because we say women are uh, caring and nurturing and you know, they, they value the emotional side of things. And, and we say men are stronger and physically stronger. But I've seen that there are some women who get stuff done more than men. Praise God. A lot of thought I'd hear some more amen. Sister Nadia. There are some women who get a lot more stuff done than men. They get up, they don't waste time and they're not waiting on anybody. They get things done. They make the call. Praise God. I was talking to my uh, hygienist and, and she said her husband wasn't working and he couldn't find a job and she jumped online and she was the one finding jobs and she was getting jobs and she said I got him all the benefits and everything she was getting stuff done. Praise God. And at the same time, Brother Chris, there are some men who are more considerate, thoughtful, caring. They look, they look out for your well-being a lot more. Than certain women. Somebody said true. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> Amen. And so what I realize, Sister Sally, is that we can't look at the outside and determine what somebody is made up of. Praise God. We can't look at a popularity contest. We can't look on the outside and determine how I'm going to value you based on who you are. I can't tell who you are based on generalizations. I wonder if you're with me. I can't tell who you are based on how the world describes you. Praise God. I can't tell you who you are based on my dis uh, uh, discrimination. I have to see what's on the inside of you to tell who you really are. And that's how I value you, based on what is on the inside, praise God. I, I, I may not be able to tell who you are, but once I see you going through something, that's when I can tell who you are. Because you're not who you are based on how you look. A lot of us can look good, dress good, talk nice, but when problems come, that's when I see who you really are. I'm getting somewhere. I'm going somewhere. We, we, we can't tell who you are based on your address, what part of the city you come from, where you work, what is behind your name, what the address is, your location, where you came from, who your family is. I can't tell who you are by none of that. But put you in some problems and let me see how you deal with the problems. I can see who you are. I I'm here to tell you, there are people here inside of this place who they will never be the most popular, but you put them in some hell. Praise God. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying to you. But they come out with flying colors. They come out looking good. Hallelujah. Don't have a million dollars, but still look good. In the worst time, Sister Erica, don't have a lot of money, don't have a lot of friends, but I'm still looking good. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you this morning? That, that's why Jesus said something. He said the wise man builds his house not on the sand. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying to you. The house can look good sitting on the sand, but when the winds come and the rains fall, the house that is on the sand is not going to fall. It is when I go through some hell, that's when I can tell who I, who I am. Praise God. It's very, very important to start out with this message, Brother Chris, because uh, uh, if we don't know what we are made up of on the inside, we won't know what we can be able to attain or achieve, number one. More importantly, if I don't know who I am on the inside, anything I attain or achieve, I will easily lose it. Because there is an enemy, Sister Gloria, that goes about seeking, y'all not hearing me, whom he may steal from, kill and devour, Sister Nardia. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? So I need to have something, a faith, a determination, a grit on the inside. Praise God. I don't care what you dress like. I don't care what you look like. I don't care who you came in here with. I don't care who brought you here. Tell me what's on the inside. Because what are, what's on the inside will determine 
Lord have mercy. This is where we find David. This is the connection. David is in the scriptures. And the problem is that sometimes we have a lot of people who are supporting us. Sometimes we have a lot of people who are around us. And we think that because we have a specific a support system or structure, we can get anything and we can go anywhere. But I don't care who supports you. I don't care who in the company likes you. I don't care even if the CEO loves you. Praise God. If you don't have that faith on the inside, you're going to go nowhere and stay there. Praise God. Lord of mercy. David is here, and David has strong support in his life. You remember David. When David came into the picture, the son of Jesse, David was prophesied by Pastor Matt by none other than the prophet Samuel. You all remember Samuel? You remember Samuel, Sister Nordia? Samuel is a, is a prophet of prophets, dedicated from his youth to prophesy straight to God. His mother couldn't have any kids, and she said, God, if you give me a baby, just want one, I'll give him back to you. Just let me hold this baby. Praise God. Mm. Sometimes you say to God, God, I just want the joy of doing something. Praise God. But I dedicate the rest of it to you. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And, and she said, and she said, I'll give him back to you. And Samuel is this child. As soon as she's weaned him, she puts him into the house of God. And he goes into the house of God and he serves God. Hallelujah. And God is talking to him from day one. He's talking to him. God is talking to Samuel so clean that when God is talking to him, he thinks it's a man calling him. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying to you. This is the prophet Samuel. When God talks, he's talking like a man talking to you. You in your house and you hear somebody call you. And you say, yes, honey, it's not me. It is God. You're not hearing what I'm saying to you. Dedicated to God. And God is speaking to him. God is the one who used Samuel. And he tells Samuel that you should prophesy to Eli and prophesy, prophesy to his sons. Tell him that the glory of God is departed. And everything he prophesied come to pass. Eli is so shocked, he falls off the chair, breaks his neck. Hallelujah. And the ark of the covenant of God is taken from the midst of the tabernacle from the people. Samuel prophesies this. Samuel is a great leader. The people respect him. Even when they call unto him, Sister Nordia, and they say, God, we want a king because we've seen everybody else having a king. Samuel says, here's what God says. God says, I am your king. Y'all not hearing what I'm saying to you. Sometimes we're looking for something and God says, you don't need that. Y'all not hearing me. God is saying, I am all you need. Samuel is great. And he prophesies and he says, God says, this is all you need. But here's what you want. I'll give you what you want. He prophesies and he anoints the first king in Israel. His name is Saul. Samuel is great. Samuel comes back and he, uh, he prophesies and he says, God says, kill the Amalekites. Destroy them. Saul doesn't destroy them. He keeps back the king and he keeps back the, the goats. And Samuel comes and he says, God speaks to him and he says, I've rejected him from being king over Israel. I found me a man whoo, after my own heart. Hello, somebody. Praise God. It was Samuel who prophesied that mom. And he comes in and he prophesies and he says, God has rejected you. I found me a man. Samuel comes in and he goes down to the house of Jesse. Let me tell you how respected Samuel is. That even when they see Samuel coming past Sister Nordia, when they hear that Samuel coming, everybody nervous. Because I don't know if he's coming with a word from God that says blessing. You all not hear what I'm saying to you. Or, 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 or God says punishment and judgment is coming. And they're nervous. You might see somebody else coming, but you know their message doesn't walk straight all the time. Sometimes it falls to the ground. But the Bible says God did not let Samuel's word, none, fall to the ground. Read that. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. And Samuel comes in and when he comes in, everybody's nervous. They don't know what he's going to say. 
And he says, and he says God, I, they're going to see me coming. They're going to know I'm going to anoint a king. He says, all right, just go down straight to the house of Jesse. He goes down to the house of Jesse. And uh, Jesse says, I have some sons. I'm going to bring some sons for you. I have to hurry up. Praise God. I, I'm going to bring some sons for you. He brings out his son. And, and, and Samuel says, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. God says, Samuel, I'm speaking to you now. This is not him. I have not chosen him. He passes all the sons before him. And Samuel says, no, nope, the Lord has not chosen these. <laughs> Love it. And he says, is there any other son? He says, I have one son. He's back in the field. Y'all not hear what I'm saying to you this morning. He says, I have another son, Pastor Mark, but he's back in the field. You don't want him. You don't tell God who he wants. Y'all not hear what I'm saying to you. God wants you. Look at somebody and tell them, God wants you. Ah, your friends might not want you. Your family might not want you. Hello? But God wants you. He anoints him. He says, God has anointed you. He has chosen you. But let me tell you something. He has prophesied over him, Sister Sally. The problem is, be careful of the prophecies of God. The real prophecies of God. The real ones. Not somebody who wants your money. Hello? Not somebody who wants to sell you a prayer cloth. Mm. Or somebody water. <laughs> no, the, the real prophecies of God. Sister Noya, they will mess up your whole life. When God prophesies. He says, Samuel, God. He says, David, God has anointed you. And instead of David's life going up. David's life goes down. Hello? After the prophecy of God. See, God has this history. Next slide. God has this history. When God prophesies to you, sometimes your life gets messed up. Hail Mary. The angel comes and says, full of grace. Next point. The Lord is with thee. Blessed are thou amongst women. And I will tell you, I would think that because God comes, and says, I'm highly favored. Everything is going to be all right. Sister Erica, here we find Mary. Husband wants to get rid of her. And she's not even married yet. You are not hearing what I'm saying to you. Joseph said, you are with child. I'm done with you. And if I'm so blessed, why can't I find a place to have this baby? She's having the baby in a manger. But God had prophesied over her life. Preach, Pastor God. I'm taking my time this morning. Praise God. Joseph had a prophecy. Sister Elsa. And Joseph said, I dream a dream. It's a prophetic dream. Because you can have a prophetic dream. He says, I dreamt a dream another time. Second one. Praise God. And he says, uh, I dreamed that the sun and the moon and the 11 stars made obeisance to me. I thought my life would go up. Instead, Joseph finds himself in the pit, in the prison, abused, accused rather, maybe abused, I don't know. His life goes down instead of his life going up. And this is where we find David. David's life is going down in spite of the prophecies of God over his life. When God really prophesies something about you, sometimes your life will get messed up. Sometimes your life will take a turn for the worse. Sometimes your, your, your life will go in a direction that you don't think your life is going to go. Are you hearing me this morning? Praise God. So David, he is the one who kills Goliath. And he gets into Saul's presence, but Saul hates him. Because the women started singing about David. <laughs> you know, women can put you in trouble. The, the women started saying, Brother Chris, Saul has killed his thousands. David has killed his 10,000. And David, Saul hears that and Saul says, no, this, this little boy is, can't come get my kingdom like this. He throws javelins. He's trying to kill him. David, who was such a good guy in his house to him. He loved him. He should have mentored him. And built him up. But he said, no, I want to kill this man. Praise God. And David is on the run. 
Sometimes you find yourself on the run, even though you have a prophecy on your life. My God, praise God. David is on the run. Saul hates him so much that Saul determines that anything that comes into contact with David, I'm going to kill them. Even in the priest, I don't care. He kills a whole slew of priests in a kingdom, in a city rather called Nob. They heard, Saul heard that they were hiding David. Somebody said David was in this place. And he goes in, Saul does, and he says, where is David? They say, we don't know. He slew, he slays all of them. The priests of God. Man, I wish I could preach. <clears throat> this morning. Because the enemy hates you so much. And wants to stop your destiny. That anything that is connected to you touches you, comes close to you, praise God. He wants to eliminate that thing. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you this morning? David is on the run. The Bible says David has to hide. He goes from Nob where he's running from Saul and he goes and he lives into a cave, Abigail. And he goes into a cave and his life is so terrible that he has to live in a cave. Can't see his mother or his father living in a cave. Praise God. And this is how bad things are. The only people that comes to David, next point, are the distressed. No, sorry, go back. Discouraged, the third, the third. The distressed, the discouraged, and those who are in debt. <laughs> now, if you want friends, you want people who can help you out. You know, let's hear what I'm saying to you. Who can lift you up. You don't want discouraged and distressed and doubtful and uh, debt, debtors around you. You want people who can actually help you up. The only people who comes to David are the distressed debtors and discouraged people in his life. Praise God. But ladies and gentlemen, God has a way of using the excluded people. Hallelujah. The discouraged people, the people who are in debt, the people who are in distress, and bless them and turn their life around. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you this morning? <coughs> Mm. Praise God. Amen. So I love God because he can turn things around. Somebody say amen. Praise God. Yeah. Take care of my throat here. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so he can turn things around. He can change what's wrong and make it right. He will use those who are rejected and excluded. Hallelujah. And you might feel like you're rejected or excluded. You might feel like you're in the worst situation or state that you've ever been in. You might feel like you've had a prophecy. Praise God. You might have a dream in your heart. Come on, somebody. You may have a, a destiny that you're trying to get to. Somewhere that you're trying to, something you're trying to accomplish. Something you're trying to get. Somewhere you're trying to get to. And you think it should have gone right. But it's gone left. But God is still saying, I will use the downtrodden. Hello. I will use the discouraged. I will use the distress. I will turn them around. Amen. David has nobody that you would want in his life. But God says, these are the ones I'm going to use to establish my kingdom. Praise God. I'm talking to somebody this morning. God can make what's wrong and make it right. Hallelujah. He will take what is broken and bless the broken. Come on, somebody. Praise God. Mm. I have something on the inside. David then is in this place where he is. He comes to this place with these distressed men. And he's in a place called Ziklag. Ziklag. And he comes to Ziklag. And in Ziklag, next slide. He comes to Ziklag. And Ziklag is this place where... David is not who he used to be when everybody loved him and he was loved by even Saul. But he's not in this place where he's yet the king. He doesn't have the kingdom. He's in between. He's in an in-between state. You understand what I'm saying? When you're in between, you're going in between. You're, you're not what you used to be, praise God, but you're not what you're supposed to be. And it's vulnerable, Sister Nordia, because you're in between. You, you don't know how things are going to work out yet. Are you, are you understanding what I'm saying? And the in-between state is very, very vulnerable. Let me, let me tell you why. Because in the in-between state, anything can happen. 
and you don't know how things are going to turn out. But, but what I want to warn you and advise you is that how you respond when things happen in the in-between state is how your life will go in the future. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? How you react and respond to the issues that you face and the things that you're going through when you find yourself in a sick lag condition. Yeah. Ha! That is how your life is going to go. The enemy loves to get you in the in-between state because he understands it's a vulnerable state for you. And if I can get you in the in-between state where you're vulnerable, I can derail your progress and stop your destiny. Mm. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Let me give you the evidence from the scripture. The Bible tells me that God had promised the Israelites that he was going to take them to a promised land. That is a prophecy and a promise from God. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? The Bible says, Sister Nordia, that in Deuteronomy 1 verse 2, that it would only take them 11 days. From Horeb, it would only take them 11 days to get to where Kadesh Barnea, to get to where God wants them to go. But because they were in the wilderness, because they were in a vulnerable state, because they were in transition, because they had to leave certain things and give up certain things, you're not sure, because they couldn't get the leads from uh, Egypt that they were used to, because they God pulled them out of their comfort zone, they started to murmur and to complain. Y'all not hear what I'm saying to you. Sometimes, Sister Sally, when you're in a bad state, the enemy says, God has a prophecy, a promise for you. I can't stop what God will do, but I need to see if I can mess you up. Y'all not catching what I'm saying to you. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get you to murmur. I'm going to get you to complain. I'm going to get you to see things the wrong way. And derail your prophecy. God said, uh, I was grieved with them, uh, even though the promise was fulfilled. He said, I was grieved with them for 40 years. Can you imagine? For 40 years, God wants to bless me. Who am I talking to? For 40 years, God wants to promote me. For 40 years, I'm talking to somebody. God wants to push you up. God wants to get you to where he has for you. God wants all the promises in the book of God fulfilled in your life. And for 40 years, he's been trying. And for 40 years, I'm grieving God because I'm in a space of transition and I don't want to respond and react. Ah, but I've come to a place in my life, ladies and gentlemen, where I have decided I don't care what kind of transition I'm in. Y'all not helping me. I don't care what kind of problem. I don't care how tough it gets. I don't care how bad sick like is. I'm going to say, although he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though it is rough sometimes, and weary sometimes, and hard sometimes, and difficult sometimes, and I don't know how it's going to work. Sometimes I'm still going to trust God. I am not going to be like the foolish women who say, curse God and die. I'm going to bless my God. Like David said, at all times, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. I'm going to sick life. I'm in transition right here. You might be looking at me and wondering why are you going through so much hell. You keep talking. Just wait and see what my God it's going to do in my life. I, I'm going to say, like they say in John, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, in all things, give thanks. This is the will of God for me. No matter how bad it is, I'm giving thanks. You all not hearing what I'm saying to you. No matter what happens, I'm giving thanks. No matter what the news is, I'm still giving thanks. Y'all are hearing what I'm saying to you. And we need to get to a state, Brother Chris, where I walk down the aisle, or down the hallway, and buck my toe on something that the kids, the kids, as far as they stay, yeah? they leave the toys out, and you step on the thing, and, and, and you say, you, you, you get to a state where you say, thank you, Jesus. Y'all are hearing me. Yeah. Woo! You, you have bad things, and instead of saying, Joshua, come here. <laughs> You say, hallelujah, glory, anyhow. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? I'm in transition. I have developed myself 
in the place of transition, I'm hurrying up. What God does in Ziklag is he does three, maybe four or five things, Pastor Mark. I, I don't know how many we're going to get through today. I know you have what? Father's Day dinner. I'm not going to keep you long. I'm joking. He does three things. The first thing that God does is that he will purge you or preserve you. All right. That's how I did it. He will preserve you. In the place of Ziklag, in your transition space, it is a place of preservation. What do you mean by that, Pastor? God will hold me back. God will keep me in Ziklag until the time is ready for me to get into the kingdom. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you this morning? I, I, Mom, I want to get to my next level. I want to get to my next step. I want to have the mega church. Yeah, let me make it real for you. No, I don't. Not really. But, but maybe you can understand that. We want to go. We want to get to our next level. But God says, I will keep you in Ziklag until you're ready. Because when you stay in this state, I am keeping you back. I am holding you. I am blocking the plans of the enemy. I am preserving you from something that the enemy is trying to do in your life. And a matter of fact, God says, I'm going to hold you until it is your time. I'm not just keeping you because I want to frustrate you. I'm keeping you because you are a secret weapon. You are not hearing what I'm saying to you. I am holding you back until I'm ready for you. You. Hell doesn't know what you can do. Oh my God. Hell doesn't know what's on the inside of you. And God says, let them think you're a fool until I'm ready for you. Let them think you can't do nothing. Let them think you can't move. Let them think you can't work. Let them think you're a nobody. When the right time comes, I'm just holding you back until I'm going to bless you, until I'm going to push you, until I'm going to use you mightily. In, 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 in Ziklag, he will preserve me, praise God. That's what David said. He preserves my soul. Y'all not hear what I'm saying to you. Praise God. The, the, the Lord has gifts and he has talents and he has abilities. But he also has a season for my gifts and my talents and my abilities. Tell, tell somebody, y'all getting, getting quiet. Tell them, your season is coming. He's preserving me from a season. He's preserving me from a season. I'm a secret weapon. You know when the Japanese had bombed, um, uh, they had bombed uh, the Pacific Islands there of the U.S. They had bombed them. Uh, they did not know that America had a secret weapon called a nuclear bomb. Oh my God, America had a secret weapon that they didn't tell anybody about it. Japan was messing around. When America got ready to use the secret weapon immediately, when they saw what kind of power that America had, Japan bowed their knee immediately and signed the retreat. I'm here to tell you, when God gets ready to move you out of preservation state into ready state, the enemy is about to bow and salute and bow the knee, the knee to the name of Jesus. Number one, he'll preserve you. Number two, he's going to purge you. Somebody said, purge me. God is going to pur purge me. What the, pres what the, what the step in Ziklag do, go does going through my hardship and my hard time, what it does, Sister Erica, is that it causes things to start to fall off of my life. Things that I don't need in my life. Things start to fall out of my life. Not just things, mm -hmm, but people start to shed away. When you're going through, when you're going through, Sister Gloria, when you're going through Ziklag, you will start to see some people just starting to disappear. And they're going, and they're going, and they're going from your life. And you're wondering, why are these people leaving me at my most vulnerable time? I need you. You don't need them. If God allows them to go, let them go. It is the purging of the Lord in your life. Oh, David is in Ziklag and he's got nobody but these distressed, doubtful, and discouraged, and dead, uh, in dead people. But God says, all you have woo, is all you're going to need. And if anybody leaves, you say, you got to get the spirit like, like 
Naomi. You know what Naomi said to Oprah? Oh my God, she hugged her and she cried and she said, bye baby, I am going back to Jerusalem. You're not hearing what I'm saying to you. You have to have the spirit that said, it's not like you're upset with anybody, Sister Sally. It's not like you have any anger spirit. You say, okay, you want to leave me? That's okay. I'm going to hug you. I'm going to kiss you. But God has my blessing. I'm going to go get my blessing over here. Uh, but, 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 but for every author, there is a root. Woo! For every author that says, I'm going back to Moab, there's a root that says, forbid me not from leaving you and forsake me not from following after you. Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. In the Persian, God is not going to leave you alone. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you this morning? Number two, he'll purge you. Number three, he will prepare you. Somebody say, he's preparing me. Oh yeah, he's preparing me for my blessing. He's preparing me for my next level. He's preparing me for my destiny. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? David said he prepares a table before me in the presence of my... God is preparing me for a blessing. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you this morning? And so God says, I'm preparing. You have to move certain things out. I have to move certain people out. I have to make way. God, Jesus says, even Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. That where I am, you can be. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? God will keep me in Ziklag. But in Ziklag, he is preserving me. In Ziklag, he's purging me. And in Ziklag, he is preparing me. So in your state of transition in your state of worry, in your state of wondering what's going on, in your state of in-between, in your state of hardship, God is preserving you. Woo! God is purging you. God is preparing you. Now the problem with Ziklag is that in Ziklag, it is a vulnerable place, as I told you, and in your vulnerable places, there's usually a bit of pain. There's usually a bit of pain, Sister, uh, Sister Haley. There's usually a, a bit of pain. And, and the problem is that the enemy, he always looks for opportunity to maximize your pain. Yeah. The, the problem with Ziklag is, Ziklag is a painful place. David is in a, a terrible place. This is how bad things are for David. David is trying something. <coughs> He's on the run from, each, uh, from Israel. The Israel nation is still there. Saul is still king at this time. <coughs> and uh, David is trying something. So he says, all right, God, you've given me a, a group of people to stay with. These rejected men. I, okay, I, I got to work with what God gives me. You ever, you ever look at your life and you say, I'm just going to work with what God gives me. I'm just going to use what I have. Praise God. And Sister Norda, David is trying and he's using what he has. And he says, God, I'm going to use this. And, and David, things start to look up. Because sometimes in Ziklag, when, when you're in your, in your pain and, and you're trying something in your uh, transition, and you're trying something, certain things will work. So what he does is, he goes to the Philistines. You remember the Philistines? David was the one who had killed Goliath, who was a Philistine. Things are so bad. David says, I need to form an alliance with the Philistines because the Israelites hate me. Lord have mercy. I don't have the time to tell you. Sometimes people hate you so bad and you're in such a tough situation that you have to form an alliance with your enemy, Pastor Mark. And he goes to the Philistines and he says, I will fight with you. The Philistines come in and he says, okay, you can fight with us. You and your men, come fight with us. And things are looking up a little bit. But in Ziklag, there's always pain. And as soon as something gets to work out, something breaks down. The Philistines look at David now and they say, David, the next fight is against the Israelites. And you are some Israelites. And you've been with us for a while, but blood thicker than water. <laughs> and you can't stay with us. You can't fight with us here because... Because in the heat of the battle, you and your men, you're going to turn against us. He said, David, it was nice having you around. It was nice. Uh, you helped us. This is like a job. You ever get those re-regret letters? 
I, I hope you don't get that. But, but, but they say it was good working with you. But, but, but we, we have decided to move in a different direction. They said, we're going to take, we're going to take the, we're, we're taking the organization in a different direction. And, and they look at David and they said, David, you and your men have to go. It's painful in Ziklag. And he comes through Ziklag and on his way back from those messages, he comes and he finds Ziklag is burned to the ground. Burned. And they not only have burnt it, but they have taken the women as well. Because the enemy is always looking for an opportunity to maximize your pain. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you this morning? The enemy wants to look at your period of transition and find a way to trip you up and mess you up. Because we don't like pain. <clears throat> we don't like to go through anything. We don't like problems, but I told you, if you're going to achieve anything, I need to be made of something substantial on the inside. Praise God. I have to have fortitude on the inside. I have to have strength on the inside. I have to have a belief down to my toe point, hallelujah, that says, in God I trust, praise God. No matter what comes, no matter what happens, no matter how hard it is, I'm not going to back away from my God and believe in God no matter what. The Bible tells me that in Ziklag they had burnt it to the ground. And not only have they burnt it to the ground, they have taken every body that was there, all the women and the children. You're not hearing what I'm saying to you this afternoon. He didn't just burn the city. He says anything that is here that you could care about, anything that is connected to you, anything that is tied to you, any way I can extract the most pain out of your life, that is what I'm going to do. But the thing I love about God is that God will allow the enemy so much brother run in the back but God says there is only so far you can go with my child. Lord, I wish I had somebody who went through hell but you still know that God was the regulator. You went through the fire but the fire didn't burn you. You went through the water but the water didn't overflow you because as much as the enemy was buffeting and moving and pushing, God stepped in and said you can only go so far. The book said they took the woman, I love it, and they took the children, but they did not slay any of them. You are not hearing what I'm saying to you. Why can't they slay them? They hate you, David. God has his hand on the life. Even though I'm going through problems, God has my hand, his hand on my life. Even though I have some issues, God has his hand. On my life, pain might be there, but God is there in my pain. Had some hardships, but God is there in my hardship. Cry sometimes, but my God is still there. He knows my name. He sees my tears. Everything that I'm going through, God said I am the regulator. Yeah. Woo. In the fire, it says they could not slay them. They did not slay the women or the children. Because God is there. It is a bad situation because the men, all the men, they look at David and they're in so much distress. They're in so much pain. That this same David who has helped them so far, they want to kill pastor. <laughs> Sister Norda, they take up stone, brother Chris. And they say, let's stone pastor David. <laughs> Because it's David's fault. You know, when anything goes wrong, you're out, they always look for somebody. Always look for somebody. And they're looking for somebody. Next point is that God will use your pain to give you a push. Last point. God will use your pain and he will give you a push. The thing I like about David, David said, watch this. I, I, I know something is wrong, but, but I'm not going to stay here. The Bible says David encouraged himself. When people are complaining, you encourage yourself. Come on, somebody. When, when people are murmuring, you encourage yourself. In the Lord, he's God. Praise God. David is in this place of purging, preservation, and he is in a place of preparation. And there is pain. 
But God is using the pain to give me a push into what God has for me. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? When, when you're going through ziklag, always look for the push that comes from God. The pain is going to cause me to push. Women, y'all to help me. When, 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 when you're in some prop, when you're in, when you're in, you're, and, and, they do, and, they, and they say, okay, it's painful. You say, okay, push. Something is coming forward. I've been in the room three times. <laughs> Amen. And, and, the doctor, and the doctor will say, okay, hold on, hold on. It's not ready yet. Don't push yet. Don't push yet. You're still in purging. Don't push yet. You're still being pre pre preserved. Don't push yet. You're still being prepared. But when the pain gets to a certain level, he says, contractions are ready. You're 10 centimeters. Push. There you go, Pastor Mark. You get to a stage, you have to push. And God says, this is time to push. It's not time to break down. It is not time to cry. It is not time to listen to the people. Because there comes a point in time where you have to look at yourself and say, mm, I don't need to hear that. I need to go in front of my God. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? God is saying, it's time to push. Praise God. Look at somebody and say, it's time to push. It's time to push. They couldn't slay them because God was with them. It's time to push. I'm done. Can you imagine I'm done? Praise God. I'm finished. The, the push, Sister Sally. I'm joking. I'm not done. The push. There are three things with the push. There are three things with the push. There is the encouragement. The Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. If you're going to push and get back up, you have to encourage yourself in the Lord. Hello, somebody. You, you, it, it is not, it is not uh, positive thinking. Because you'll try positive thinking, brother Chris, and sooner or later, you even get tired of your own self. <laughs> you not hearing what I'm saying to you. I'm tired of hearing myself positive thinking, but, but David encouraged himself in the Lord. Have you ever had to encourage yourself in the Lord? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You're not encouraging yourself in the Word. You're not encouraging yourself in the news. You're not encouraging yourself in the expert. You're encouraging yourself in the Lord. And you're saying to yourself, but wait a minute, my God is a good God. Y'all are, yeah, my God always comes through. My God always delivers. I've seen, the, I've never seen a righteous forsaken. I, I'm encouraging myself in the Lord. N number one, he encouraged himself. Number two, he went for the effort. He says to the priest, Abiathar, he says, bring me the effort. Is three P's, five P's, and three E's. Push, uh, sorry, uh, uh, preserve, purge, pr uh, prepare, pain, and push. And then number one is encourage. Number two, he says, get the effort. It means I need to know how I come before my God. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? I, I don't just come before God any old way. I need to know how I come before God. I need to know how I pray before God. And I say, God, specifically, this is what you said. You said people are getting uh, Israelite garments these days, even in our times. And they're getting effort. The effort is just really a, 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 a sleeveless garment. And they're walking around in the churches and they're, they're representing Israel, uh, Israel by wearing the effort. I don't know if you've ever seen some of them and they're wearing it. But, but the effort is really representative of how I come before God. It's a priestly garment. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And it makes no sense. I have a garment on and my heart is not, y'all not hearing me, right before God. Number one, encourage. Number two is effort. Get the effort, get myself right before God and come before God with how God says I'm supposed to come before him. If we come before God right, God will never turn a blind eye. If I come before God with what God says, God will always hear me. If I come before God with how God acts, with how God says I should be here, God will always hear me. Praise God. Number one, he encouraged himself. Number two, he went for the effort. And number three, he inquired. Finished. Number three, inquired. Uh -uh. The last thing I need to know is, God, what shall I do in this situation? 
How should I act in this situation? Where should I go in this situation? What should be the steps that I take in this situation? The Bible says that David came before the Lord and he said, God, shall I pursue them? Shall I go after them? What should I do? I, I'm not just hot-headed. I'm not just going to say, God says this. But I'm going to say, God, I know you said this, but, but tell me, teach me how to go after this. Teach me how to go after my dreams. Teach me how to raise my family right. Teach me, God, how, how to be a good person. Teach me, God, how to go after this in the workplace. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you this morning? God, you promised me this one, but how should I do it? Praise God. Teach me how to witness to souls in this world. Praise God. I need to encourage myself, yes. I need to get before God in a proper way. But I need to inquire of the Lord and go after what God says. I'm done. The Bible says that David inquired of the Lord. God says, David, you shall pursue them or you shall overtake them and you shall recover all. In the name of Jesus this morning. Praise God. Amen. God bless you. I want to encourage you to get back up. Get back up and go for what God has for you. Encourage yourself. Get the ephod and go before God.